so I'm go just going to introduce our panel briefly. Um, next, we have Ursula Pachol, who is the um, Deputy Director General of BEUK, the European Consumers Association. Um, next to BEUK is Annick Moons, who is a lawyer with Lumiere, which is a Benelux uh, distribu film distribution company. Then we have Julia Reda, who is an MEP, who is a Parliament's re rapporteur on copyright reforms. And then we have Cecilio Madero, who is a Deputy Director General for Competition in DG Competition at the European Commission. Also, maybe I can start with you from what Bill was saying. I mean, it seems that if you're an Arsenal fan, you can watch Arsenal football matches from France or Belgium. You can watch the Rugby World Cup without too much problem. If you're a fan of Danish series, you can watch them without too much trouble here in Belgium or even in France or Spain or wherever you might be. My, do you think that there is a problem with the current copyright system? Yes, indeed. I think it's not as simple as you just said, that consumers can easily watch content cross-border from other countries. As we have seen from the recent uh, issue paper of the European Commission, 70% of online content is actually blocked, uh, geo-blocked or geo-filtered. Uh, which means that consumers do normally not have access to cross-border online content. And we know that from our member organizations that consumers are increasingly frustrated about the fact that they see the black screen saying, sorry, but this content is not available for you. So just to say that if we all maybe take a step back, and I invite you to do so, and look at the digital single market, uh, which is in reality a market that is completely fragmented and does not allow consumers to buy things cross-border that they want to buy legally. They want to pay for the content. We know that from studies that 80% of consumers say they really would like to pay for the content. They don't want to be pirates. They don't want to use uh, VPN solutions to circumvent um, DRMs, so they really would be interested. Um, at the same time, I think we should not overstate the impact that an opening of the system would have. So we hear a lot of uh, black scenarios about funding that would no longer be possible and cultural diversity going down. But from what we can see, there is um, a need to open up to consumers who really actively demand to buy cross-border. We don't ask for European wide licensing system to put into place, but consumers should not be blocked. I think this is really the logic of the single market. And if that is not possible, I think consumers' trust and kind of expectation in the single market are really not um, possible anymore. The credibility of the digital single market, I think, really depends on the policy responses that we will receive, particularly on these questions. But there's, I mean, there's a difference between where you can't get the content exactly what, where exactly on the website you want in one precise format. But that doesn't always mean that you can't get the Premier League some other way, uh, or a film via DVDs, or Premier League via, uh, if you go to a pub or, or the like. And the, um, in your line of work, it is about, present, about tailoring the content you have and the films and so on, specifically to the needs and the interests of the local markets, right? Yes, so maybe it's uh, easiest if I shortly explain how we work. So we are um, uh, an independ independent Benelux distributor, all rights, which means that um, we are buying movies and series on the international market. Uh, in most cases, this is before production starts or during pre-production, so based on a script or just names from the cast or the name of the director. And uh, at that moment, um, we are asked to guess, to, to make a gamble if this movie would work Sorry. in our territories, if people in Benelux would want to see this movie. Uh, so this is mainly based on the cultural specificities of our countries, which are already very much divided in the three territories that we are working in. Uh, for example, we know that French comedy uh, is something that we would like to release in French-speaking Belgium and in Luxembourg, but it would not work in Dutch-speaking Belgium and in the Netherlands because the humor is totally different. People do not 
really understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so it's that experience that makes that we make a guess on a movie. Will it work? Will it w won't it work? And after that, so we at that moment we pay a lot of money for this movie. Uh, we uh, we pay in advance, which we would like to uh, win back through the different windows, uh, starting with theaters. Um, and then it goes on to DVD, VOD, and in the end, the television stations. So um, our aim is to uh, have a break even and even sometimes make some profit out of this movie. Um, and it's all based on our perception if this movie will work or not. And um, if the borders would be put open, if there would be indeed a cross-border availability, this would mean that I think a lot of local distributors will fall out because, for example, I will talk in examples, I think it's more easy. Mo the movie La Grande Bellezza, which is a masterpiece. Um, Sorry, which one? La Grande Bellezza. It's ah, yes. an Italian yeah, movie. It's an Italian film, yeah. Um, it, it has, I think it has been released in Italy uh, um, in May of last year. It has been released in Belgium um, four months later. And if we would... Um, start from this cross-border availability, this would mean that the Italian version of the movie would already be available on on-demand platforms at the moment of theatrical release in Belgium. And in that case, there is no theater in Belgium which would, would be willing to make any effort to release this movie because it's already out there, it's already available, the exclusivity is gone. So and also in the other windows, pay TV, other on-demand platforms, we would not have any possibility to sell such kind of movie because... But so you play an important role in, in targeting films to specific audiences, um, presenting it in a way that they, they appreciate it and when they can... Um, and putting them sort of in touch with, with, with the works. But you also play a role in financing the making yes. of so of that film. was my second so, point. <laughs> so it's also important for the, for the upstream industries. And Julia, I know that you've got... Copyright is is your is one of your um, absolute favourite issues. You, <laughs> you how do, I mean how do you balance that? You know the desire to have um, to be able to do th watch everything now, uh, see a film when you want to see it, where you want to see it, and the fact that the existing system really does cater to an ecosystem that, that by a lot of accounts is very effective and produces lots of of a great content? Well, uh, I think it's quite clear that no sane person would have designed uh, this system uh, that we have today with the internet in mind. We have a historical copyright system uh, that has been transposed onto the internet, but uh, I think everybody who has grown up with the internet knows that the concept of borders doesn't really make sense online. And so I think uh, from a user's perspective, uh, uh, Geoblocking is very much perceived as this uh, artificial border and it's a bit unfair that uh, on the one hand the European Union is uh, making a lots of efforts uh, to um, uh, provide freedom of movement to businesses and that uh, consumers then when they're online are once again uh, confronted with these borders. I think in practice uh, how I deal with it or how a lot of people deal with it uh, is uh, to use VPNs. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, quite clear. I think there are probably a lot of people in the audience who are using VPNs in order to circumvent geoblocking. And I think the really, um, the, the really ironic part of the, uh, this is that a lot of people are actually paying for their VPNs. So these are paying customers uh, where well, unfortunately the money that they pay in order to access content does not go to the creators or not even to the distributors of the content because there is no legal way for them to actually pay uh, for uh, the service that they want to have. Um, I've, I'm actually not convinced that uh, it would have any effect whatsoever uh, on the, th the people, the amount of people going to the theater in Belgium if an Italian film in Italian were available online. There are not that many it people in Belgium in who, who watch uh, 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 an Italian film. And if it would not be in the cinemas, that would be a business decision 
of the cinemas under the current rules, but I don't think that if we change the rules, the industry would not adapt to but it. Because pre presumably, at the Parliament, you've looked into this question of whether, yeah. you know, to what extent reform risks throwing out the baby with the, the bathwater. Well, uh, in my report, on the one hand, we have said, okay, the, the principle of territoriality is uh, a part of the copyright system, but territoriality just means that copyright applies in a particular territory. That territory could be anything, a territory could also be the European Union. My report also says that linguistic minorities must <coughs> not be barred from viewing content in their own language. But unfortunately, this is uh, the result of the geo-blocking today. We have 55 million people in the EU that are part of regional and linguistic minorities, and unfortunately, they will not be helped by the portability regulation, for example, because they find themselves permanently on the wrong side of the border. You have a Danish-speaking minority in Germany, Swedish-speaking minority, minority in Finland, and uh, these people would like to legally watch uh, uh, content online in their own language, but uh, they will never be strong enough uh, in order for, for them to create a market demand. Uh, I don't think any uh, company is going to make the investment to provide uh, this offer in Swedish within Finland or anything uh, along those lines, but there would be no economic damage from simply allowing them to participating in the offer that is already there. The language itself is a natural form of geo-blocking that nobody has a problem with. But I guess as, as European citizens, they may even have a certain right to be able to, to buy across borders in, in, that, <coughs> in that sort of way. And so, see, I just wanted to bring you in. You, I mean, of course, DG Competition is, is uh, very concerned with market integration and with um, protecting and driving the single market. Is, is it coherent with a single market the fact that you have 28 different national copyright systems, you have territoriality, um, is the basis for which content is licensed out? <clears throat> Thank you for this question. Uh, allow me very quickly to, as I am the only EU official in, in this panel. By the way, I don't know if it is pure coincidence, but uh, either you have your block being on the left side of the of the panel, or it's, or it's pure geolocalization. And, uh, but in any case, I hope that I won't represent here any specific left or right <laughs> uh, opinion, just try to be fair. And I like very much the fact that you start by talking about market, market integration, because uh, very quickly I would like, and you know me enough to understand that I normally do not escape answers when I, but I said that I should start as the only you official, not in the room, I guess, but in this panel by saying that Obviously, my words today only represent my own uh, opinion, and they do not necessarily are those of the institution for which I have the honor uh, to work. Uh, and I think it's good that we talk about consumers in a way which is, uh, let's say, fair enough. Uh, my commissioner, uh, Margaret Vesteyers, likes to make reference to something which is, in my opinion, very, very, very significant. In 96, the most powerful computer was the size of a tennis court. And uh, it cost f uh, 55 million dollars to develop. By the way, the developer was IBM. Ten years later, a PlayStation 3, which is the size or can, be fit, can fit on a tabletop, is as powerful as what uh, needed a tennis court ten years before. In 2005, I'm giving some figures to, to, to frame the, the discussion, less than a quarter of Europeans had uh, broadband at home. Uh, now it's nearly 80% of EU citizens in these 28 member states that you have mentioned. The disparity is there, but it's 80% average. And two thirds of us can sign up for next generation uh, access. At the same time, we are telling our 28 national uh, uh, nationals or a citizen or a citizen from uh, member states that in principle there is no better place for trade in the single market uh, than the internet when I'm, I'm, until proof of the contrary physical location is is irrelevant but uh, I have to say it is in principle the case because we know now today when we are speaking here that there is still linguistic, 
but also uh, regulatory and contractual barriers which make it impossible to uh, use the internet as in principle uh, it should be used. And in fact, our DSM strategy, digital single, uh, digital single market strategy, is in fact a coordinated, and it's important to say, coordinated drive launched by the Commission, President Juncker, Vice President Ansip, but with a clear contribution of Commissioners Oettinger and Vestager to try to improve things and get rid of these barriers, while striking a decent ba balance between creators but also consumers. Because the idea is to find the right balance between the interests of uh, inventors, which are, I understand, uh, very well represented here today, creators, distributors, artists, but also consumers who happen to, to be not only EU citizens, but also taxpayers. But so you no, no, I, I'm finishing. Now, go and tell <laughs> to an European Union citizen who, who happened to be a consumer and a taxpayer, as I said before, that he cannot buy goods, services, or digital content within the single market. And try to explain this in a coherent way. I haven't heard... I mean, I, we are, and this is the reason why, and now I go to your question. Well, you will understand I cannot say much about the famous pay TV case, uh, which is one of our ongoing investigations, because it is... I wouldn't say I have to be careful sub judice, because we are not judges. We are an administrative authority, we are enforcers of antitrust rules. But it is obvious that I'm not going to discuss in front of you something which is an ongoing discussion, by the way, tough, but uh, uh, at the same time transparent, hopefully, between the six major American studios, Sky uh, TV UK, and ourselves. So I'm not going to discuss here the case. But it is obvious that the only thing that the Commission tries to do with this famous case is not to challenge or to put at risk or put it, call it as you want, uh, exclusive territoriality uh, agreements that under the current copyright uh, framework, which is, by the way, uh, these are national frameworks instead of uh, sort of overall uh, European framework, we are not putting at risk and we are not challenging te uh, territoriality, exclusive territoriality agreements between broadcasters and distributors. What we are doing, and it is said on the basis of current jurisprudence from the, from the Court of Justice, and also uh, in line with our uh, uh, guidelines and uh, block exemption, is that when you decide to go to another member state and you have paid for your uh, TV programs in, in the UK, this is applicable, by the way, to other member states because we have started with the UK, but we are also investigating Spain, Italy, Germany. So it's, it's, uh, there is no discrimination, as you can imagine. We submit that when a EU citizen who happened to have been told that the single market is a perfect idea and that you can do, uh, provided it is legal, and you pay for it, because I cannot agree more with what Mr. Cavada said. You cannot own or use something that you haven't paid for. By the way, what we are just saying, and it is just uh, an ongoing investigation and we haven't come to any conclusion, is that if you decide to go to another country because you live there, because you are going to spend several weeks or months or uh, whatever reason to, your, uh, to another country within the European Union, and you want to that your preferred TV programs follow you, I don't see why this so-called, sorry for the legal jargon, passive sales that, as you know, is unsolicited. Uh, you, I mean, it's not the broadcaster who is saying to Greek consumers or Spanish uh, viewers, uh, buy my program, buy my package, Sky uh, UK uh, products. It's simply someone who goes to Spain and who decides to use uh, its already paid subscription in order to follow Premier League matches in English which I submit is a fair thing. And the same goes for a poor European citizen, happens to be a taxpayer, who says, I want to, I, I'm a Greek, but I want to, 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 to follow Manchester, uh, uh, Liverpool, for example, in English. Even if uh, there is the possibility to do it in, 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 in Greek. Why on a single digital market? Why in a so, supposedly integrated Europe, we have no right to do so, paying and protecting and without challenging 
the overall exclusivity that in any case but it, the is. it sounds like it sounds like uh, yeah, they there may where copyrights involved where where national copyrights involved there may though be some uh, exceptions to the rule that um, you should have uh, you, there should be no barriers to um, buying anything on the basis of your nationality or your your place of residence um, I mean, it is a, it's certainly a famous case. I think Beaux made uh, quite a famous video recently where you have people walking into a shop and they seem, you seem uh, certain that, that sort of, this sort of thing is completely against EU free, free, movement, uh, free movement rules. Sorry. <laughs> sure, I mean, I think we have to distinguish two types of geo-blocking, if I may. So one is in e-commerce, so products that you buy uh, online and the other thing, and I think it's a bit more complicated, of which we talk today, is about audiovisual content and geo-blocking in there. But I think it was already mentioned by Julia, but just to underline, we have the four freedoms of the uh, European market, of the single market, and I think for, for a very long time, the focus has been really on the freedoms for the businesses to provide uh, services, to provide products without any borders. I think it's high time to look now at the other side of the coin, and in particular to the right which is actually enshrined in the treaty that um, citizens cannot be discriminated against because of their uh, place of residence or nationality. And if we apply this to the audiovisual services, I think it is very obvious that uh, there are many cases of unjustified geo-blocking. Mm. And as I said before, we do not call for a full system of European licenses in all cases. There may be good reasons that for local adaptations of, of subtitling or dubbing that you have a territorial license. We do not question that system, but we think uh, that consumers, if they want to reach out, to buy cross-border, they should not be geo-blocked and they should not be discriminated against. And we think this is a consumer right. right. And it perfectly fits the whole philosophy and the concept of the digital single market. If we are not able to materialize this, I think the whole project is not really worth the paper right. it's written on. I, I'm going to take a, a question from the, a couple of questions from the floor in a moment. But I just, but I just wanted to come back to, to you. I mean, assuming it's the status quo and things stay as, as they are, you know, the world is changing. There's all sorts of technological developments. There's all sorts of business developments. I saw that in the US, Twitter has now got to deal with the NFL to carry its contents. There's, I think, the Discovery Channel that has European right, pan-European rights for, uh, for the Olympics in Europe. I mean, what can you do to try and, to try and make, your, make your content more accessible and sort of get around mm. this this complaint that many people have, whether it's uh, Commissioner Vestager or whether it's European consumers, that they just bang up against mm -hmm. uh, blank screens. I think uh, it's wrong to portray um, the sports or the audiovisual sector more widely as, as being against innovation, in favour of innovation. Um, the plethora of digital platforms means there's more markets that you can um, get your uh, output um, at, out to the consumer. So uh, embracing change is fine. Uh, I think there's a big distinction between portability and much of what's been said, uh, uh, not everything, I agree, but much of what's been said is really about portability of buying a service and then taking it with you regardless of which, whichever uh, internal border you're, you're crossing. The Premier League and, and sports more generally have no problem with, with portability. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do and we've been coming to terms with it since the um, Pub Landlady case, uh, which was about satellite and emphatically not about the internet, but nevertheless it's about portability of satellite cards. And that established the principle that if uh, uh, someone has bought uh, 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 a satellite card in one country and uses it in another for the same purpose, namely consumption at <coughs> home, then that's perfectly legitimate. So we've mm. been living with that ECJ judgment for some years. But you don't feel so, the need to So try embracing portability is not a problem. I think, though, uh, and you, you've heard some echoes of it here, many people talk about portability as simply being a very small baby step uh, to be then very quickly followed by moving to full cross-border access. And I think because the, right across the audiovisual sector, because customers by and large are very, very happy with what they've got, to move rapidly through portability, well, it's this thing about, about evidence, uh, sort of responding perhaps unnecessarily to a shake of a head next to me, there is very, very little 
authentic evidence, broadly based, about consumers across the whole of Europe that they are heavily dissatisfied with the supply of service that they currently have. If you ask them, would you like more uh, than you currently have, and if you, would you like prices to be lower, they will, of course, say yes in those sorts of things. But the Eurobarometer, which is uh, uh, published um, last year, I think, uh, it showed that the, the vast majority of demand is thoroughly domestic for audiovisual products. Yes, there is some demand for portability. There's some demand for portability, which the audiovisual sector is moving to accept and to provide systems for. Uh, and there are arguments about the pace of change, and there are arguments about uh, definitions of temporary residence or proof of residence, and then temporary um, absent from that residence and so on. But these are second and third order But it issues. did show that young people were much keener to access content across border than, than... I mean, it's true sure. that overall the average was not very high, but among young people it was quite high. Sure. It was, I think, 20-odd percent. Um, and this was phrased in a, in, in a general way. Much of the content those people would want to get. Take music, for example. Music pretty well sells on either European or global licenses. And increasing, music has moved in 10 years um, to uh, uh, a system where they have global release dates, for example, for, for songs. And when I was a lad, you know, something would be released in America months before it would be released in, in the UK. It doesn't happen anymore. So the idea that that um, copyright-based industries don't innovate and don't embrace change is wrong. They are, though, consumer-driven. And the danger about moving to something which is reckless in terms of consumer interest is that you'll drive up price and reduce choice. And the, the, the case was made at the point about what, why shouldn't someone who wants a, a Greek citizen living anywhere in Europe subscribe for an English-language Premier League service? Well, that's fine, but they'll pay the English-language price. And then, of course, and then if someone in the UK wants to access the Greek service of, for the Premier League, because they want those pictures with the, uh, mediated to them through a Greek service, because that will so undermine markets, what sports will have to do is price to their main market and supply their main market and say to everyone, of course you can, you've got cross-border access, that's what the law in this hypothetical future would say, you have a cross-border right, but you'll have to consume at the core price. So you take something like German handball, for example, which is very popular in Germany, it's not popular elsewhere. So what German handball will have to do is price it at the German price across the whole of Europe. So, and I mean, that will not be good for consumers outside of Germany. Cecilia, I see you, you're over there. You, you disagree? Is this not a concern for the Commission when it looks at these issues? I don't know if I disagree or I agree, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I think. Uh, I mean, Go with the evidence. If it is, I'm, I'm very happy to hear a representative from Premier League saying that there is no issue with portability. If this is the case, I think that uh, the first thing to do uh, by your company and others represented here is to embrace as soon as possible the proposal and in this respect the Commission under the control of uh, Commissioner uh, Oettinger is putting forward. And I heard Mr. Cavada saying that, uh, in principle, there is some consensus within the parliament about portability. This would be already a good step in the right direction. Here, we are not talking about dominant companies in, in any respect. And by the way, I won't talk today about dominant companies. Uh, but I have the feeling when I heard you saying that viewers or your consumers are happy, this reminds me of uh, what I hear when we are running uh, one or two or uh, uh, unilateral uh, conduct cases, that not typically dominant companies come to see us saying, but the market is working very well and our, our uh, citizens or our consumers are very happy. What we think, I think that we are all adults, in particular you citizens, let them decide what makes them happy. I mean, I don't think that it is well, you, you have understood me, I mean, you are clever. So, let citizens decide what they want. Uh, I don't want tomorrow, for obvious reasons, I'm just a humble EU official, uh, read that the theory of Madero is calling for pan-European licensing of uh, content, or that uh, we should open market for active selling uh, outside uh, of uh, content, outside uh, uh, licensed territories. 
As I said, my own opinions are not relevant, but certainly I'm not calling for it. I'm just, what the, we, we are doing with this case that I repeat, the pay TV case, is still under scrutiny, and we have to reflect about how to strike a decent balance, as I said before, is to make sure that there is no absolute territorial protection. In other terms, that uh, there is a possibility for uh, uh, Sky UK TV, if you want so, to respond. If you want so, there is no even obligation, positively from, to someone who from another member state is willing, because he's happy with your products, it should be taken this as a compliment, to, to watch the match, uh, whatever match he, uh, he, he or she wants, from your, from your uh, uh, channel instead of using the alternative offer that he could have in Bulgarian, Greek or Spanish. So what we are saying is that uh, while exclusivity and licensing of content member state, by member state under the current copyright framework is legal and we are not trying to destroy it, I repeat it in order to avoid possible misinterpretations, the Court of Justice and DG Competition and the Commission as a whole tends to show deference to judges in a democratic society. I think this is one of the key principles. The Court of Justice has told us, and in particular with the famous Murphy uh, judgment uh, to Premier League, that this sort of passive sales are legal. And if this is legal, or until proof of the contrary, there is no good justification which would prevent EU citizens from choosing this type of alternative way of seeing digital content, we should try to facilitate well, such an outcome. I mean, there's, there's clearly, there's, I mean, as, as you said, the competition law can, can only go so far in driving through um, change in, in uh, to the way that copyright works in Europe. Joe, you seem to be persuaded that change is, is necessary and right. And maybe, and I think this has got to be the, the last question for the, for the session, unfortunately. But, I mean, just in a few words, I mean, words, what do you think, looking at the Parliament, its composition, attempts to reform copyright have come and failed time and time again? Are you hopeful that it will be possible to push change through? Yes, I think uh, the European Parliament uh, debate has uh, moved forward quite a bit because of the discussion around my report. Uh, it did not uh, back up moving towards a European copyright uh, at this point. Uh, however, I think uh, the, the most realistic way of addressing geo-blocking um, on, uh, on a more general level than the portability regulation does, which is a kind of uh, a roaming for Netflix, which is nice but doesn't really address the problem for a lot of people. Uh, I think the, the most realistic way of uh, getting change quickly um, is uh, to extend the scope of the cable and satellite directive. So to say, okay, um, you can clear the rights uh, for a particular work in the country from, from which you are operating, uh, you don't advertise it in other countries, but you don't have to <coughs> geoblock it either. Uh, I have to say there certainly is uh, a demand from consumers for this. You could see this if you want to have evidence uh, in the responses to the Commission consultation on geoblocking, where a vast majority of consumers have said uh, that they want this. And also more generally, I have to say, uh, uh, industry representatives, uh, be it uh, representatives of collecting societies, of uh, sports rights holders, of uh, film rights holders uh, generally claim to speak for the interest of their industry. Well, uh, if I'm supposed to accept that as a politician, then you also have to accept that it's the consumers' representatives who speak for the consumers. But consumers Very speak good. for consumers. Very good. Well, let's um, let's <coughs> end on on that now. I'd like to thank the, our panel very much for for having been with us today. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Ryan, who is uh, doing the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.